don't get involved in politics, but do a lot of PR. Define yourself. Hire Jay. Define yourself before your adversaries can define you. So it's not every day that I get the chance to interview somebody who's made a billion dollars. So Greg Lindbergh, thank you so much for coming on the show and welcome to an episode of Mentors Collective. Mm -hmm. Now for those listening, Greg turned a company, Home Care Week, which he started in college into a billion dollar company. He's obsessed with biohacking just like me, so we're gonna dive into that. Awesome. And we're gonna dive into something a little bit personal that I, I hope you're, you're, you're willing to share, and I think the audience is gonna get a lot of value out of it. So thank you for, for being open with me. Thank you for being here, Greg. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't get the chance to learn from someone who's made a billion dollars every day. So I, I appreciate you, and I, I look forward to getting some wisdom from you today. Well, we're all students, and thank you for having me, Jay. It's great to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. I appreciate your time. We get to break in this new studio. And like you said, we're all students. We're always yeah, learning, we constantly are. learning. Uh, so Greg, with, the, with that yeah. spirit and always learning, how do you make a billion dollars? Well, it's, um, it's a period of making mistakes over and over again. The, the art of success is learning how to fail. The mm -hmm. first book I wrote was Fail Early, Fail Often. The more failure you have in life, the more you see failure as a practice shot the more chance you have of ultimately being a success. Our whole society teaches us not to fail. School, you get an F, that's a, that's a terrible thing. But it's not. All of my great lessons, all of the successes, all of the forward progress we've made has come after failure. That's a great insight. Failure is experimentation, and if you're ex constantly experimenting, eventually things are gonna work. I think people get complacent, people get scared of failure. Uh, so I'm sure you failed a few times throughout your journey, but I'd love to hear what that journey was like. The timeline from in college, you're starting your first company now to making, starting a company worth over a billion dollars. That doesn't happen overnight. That's not all luck. How did that happen? What was, what was the journey? I would describe it like this. In, in quantum physics, there's a concept of everything that can happen does happen. The world that we see actually exists as a probability wave. And you keep in your mind that everything that can happen does happen. You just have to find the right way to accomplish it. No matter what kind of challenging situation you're in, no matter what kind of business problem you have, personal problem, legal problem, whatever challenge you have, there's a solution. There is a vision of your future where you've succeeded. It's out there. Yeah. And on a quantum mechanics level, some physicists believe it's already happened because time is invariant, time goes backwards and forwards. So you have to keep that in mind. There is a solution, there is a way, I just have to keep going. And the art is to keep going. Never, ever quit. Quitters never win, winners never quit. So in, as far as the journey, it's been a thousand and one different attempts in different directions. I started with Home Care Week. You mentioned Home Care Week. That was my first product. It was a healthcare compliance newsletter for home health agencies. This is back in 1991. Um, this is before the internet when I wrote this thing up and I mailed it out to subscribers and I got $200 checks in the mail for subscriptions. And that was a good day when I got a $200 check. So I remember uh, driving to the bank. You know, I have one or two or three checks and that would be a great day. Three checks, you know, six, $700. And so I had a little uh, one room office that I paid $285 a month for. I slept in the office. I lived in the office. I ate at the Golden Corral um, and I showered at the gym. I didn't have, a, I didn't have an apartment. And I did that for years. Actually, throughout my 20s, I didn't have a girlfriend. Um, for most of the time, I just worked. I was kind of a monk, you know, I just focused. Mm. And I love what I did. It was, you know, a labor of love. And that ultimately led to uh, a business by the first eight, nine years, I was doing about five million in revenue, a publishing company. Okay, and so then, the newsletter turned into a publishing company. Correct. Okay, what were you doing in that publishing company? Publishing other newsletters. We started one newsletter and then we launched a whole bunch of newsletters from technology to uh, market research and all kinds of other things. And then we started buying companies. And in 2001, we did our first acquisition. And since then I bought about 125 different companies. Wow, all in the same industry, all in publishing? Highly varied. Our business today, the global growth group of companies, which is the group of companies that I'm the beneficial owner of, um, have about 50 different operating units. We range from publishing still to training and certification to technology to healthcare software to debt collection, uh, accounts receivable management to uh, we own, um, I'm the beneficial owner of Beckett, which is a big sports brand. Cool. So we have a whole wide variety of, of different businesses. It's uh, fairly diversified, about a billion seven in revenue this year. 
I've talked to a few billionaires and a lot of things they, they have in common when I'm trying to extract this information from their brain is that there's a, a few leaps that they've went through to become a billionaire. They didn't just go from like one company and then grew that company to a billion in a straight shot. There were several events that happened in their business career that led to that billion dollar idea, that billion dollar business. Uh, what was the first big leap for you? Was it turning that newsletter into a publishing company and building the publishing company? That's a great question. I think the very first thing is to take the leap to go out on your own, be an entrepreneur, to take the leap to be out and try to try to create a business. I remember I had 12 employees when my dad was still asking me when I was going to get a job. Mm. He didn't understand. He was a pilot. He had a job his whole life. And so cutting against, I mean, my family, had, there's no entrepreneurs. And, and, you know, my mom and dad were, you know, that wasn't their thing. So going out on your own is very important. And then the, the second most important thing was basically be willing to sacrifice your personal life, unfortunately, to be a successful entrepreneur, you've got to sacrifice. I didn't, I didn't have, a, I mean, in my 20s for a, a man and a young man in their 20s to have no social life, that's difficult. That's your prime for a lot of men. And so you have to make a sacrifice. And then number three was mastering the art of buying businesses. It's really important in thinking growing a business. You can't just grow organically to uh, most businesses can't grow organically to a billion and seven in revenue. Uh, you have to buy businesses. So right. buying businesses is absolutely critical. Uh, and there's a lot of people who build a successful business, generational change. They want to retire. They want to sell. So learning how to buy businesses is probably the single most important thing I did in building this group of companies. So your secret to building wealth, because everyone seems like they have a different path that they take. You ask yeah. 10 billionaires how they made a billion dollars. The answers seem to be very different across the board. So you found something that worked for you. You were good at buying businesses. Uh, how did that method work, like start to finish? How did you identify businesses that you wanted to buy? Obviously, they weren't all in the same industry. Correct. And then what did you do once you bought those businesses? Why were you able to transform them into businesses that made you a billionaire? That's a great question. So mm -hmm. the, the first thing is taking a look and reevaluating everything in the business. A lot of people have run a business for 10 or 20 years. They've owned it. They started it. And they kind of got stuck in their ways. They A fresh perspective on a business can have a tremendous impact. So the biggest thing we did uh, very early on in 2007, we opened office in India. And that was in uh, the days when moving positions to India was not a big deal. Uh, you know, not, not a lot of people were doing it. Mm -hmm. It was kind of rare. And so we were, we were really early on in the publishing business of building a fantastic Indian team to run our, our publishing companies. Mm -hmm. And as the publishing industry started to die, we kept making money because our costs were lower than everybody else. Mm -hmm. We did the layout over there. We did the graphic design over there. We did some of the editorial. We did all the marketing, the public. So the whole publishing process, the accounting, the HR management, all that stuff can be done at India. And so... Just simple innovation like that, these small publishing companies, thank you, these small publishing companies don't have an offshore office. Now today, uh, 2023, it's very easy to hire one person in India and, and get, you can hire them in Ukraine or Bulgaria or wherever. Right. Offshoring is no big deal now. But uh, 2007, it was very effective. And that kept the publishing business going long enough. It since mostly died um, so that we can invest in other things and grow the business. How long did it take from... You being in college, starting that first newsletter to really finding success, or did you struggle for a while? I don't think I've really found success yet. I mean, I think success has eluded me, and I think once you find success, it's the beginning of the end. When you say, hey, I'm successful, I can rest on my laurels, I can relax, that's dangerous. Right. You can't relax. Entrepreneurs, I feel like, good ones, never relax. You can't. The, the bar is always moving, as it should be. If relaxations are very dangerous in business, as you grow, what happens is you move from worrying. The first concern is cash flow and payroll and your customers. And then you worry about competitors. And then as you get bigger in this country, sadly, you worry about the government coming after. Him. And no, I mean, look at Elon Musk. His number one concern is the government coming after him. Right. They just announced uh, yesterday that the grand jury is looking at indicting Elon Musk for something related to his personal expenses at Tesla. You know, his number one concern is the government coming after them. So you always have someone coming after you. And it's not, you can't just relax. I, I My competitors are mastered. That's a piece of cake. Um, and if I was still a small little business, the government wouldn't care. Right. I wouldn't be a big target. 
They like big targets. They like big news. So um, you always, always have to be concerned about something. You know, maybe the next thing to be concerned about is UFOs. I don't know what we're going to be concerned about next, but um, climate change is a big deal. Po po politics, government, war, war with China. I mean, these are that would be a huge problem for right. most businesses if there's a war with China. So never, ever relax. Right. And the bigger you are, the more open and vulnerable you are to those types of attacks. Exactly. I mean, it took until you had built a billion dollar empire to be attacked yourself, if that's, that's right. correct. That's right. Tell me a little bit about that experience uh, for you from your perspective. I was incredibly naive. You know, I've, I've got a, my series of growing in life has been going through a series of overcoming naivete on different subjects. You know, the first, I was, I was so focused on business in my 20s, I was very naive about uh, dating, for example. You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't, if I didn't date, Anybody, I didn't understand the dating world. I was just sitting in my office cranking out newsletters all day long. I had no idea what dating was about. And so I had to learn that. And that took me through a marriage and divorce and all that. Um, and then I had to learn about different, I'd learn about finance, I'd learn about all these things. The biggest thing I was naive about was politics. Mm -hmm. I made a very naive, oh, I'll just donate to the existing insurance commissioner because he, he asked me for a donation, I'll give him a donation. And I didn't think anything of it. Little did I realize that his opponent, who had been trying to take his job for 20 years and failed, would see me as an arch enemy and try to put me in prison so he could win an election, which he successfully did, and I successfully won the case, uh, first round of it. So politicians can be evil, just absolutely desperate to win an election, and they'll do anything to win an election. Right, and we see politics being weaponized. You mentioned Elon Musk in a lot of ways, and I think... Elon Musk is a prime example because in some ways he opens himself up to attacks by being outspoken and saying things that go against the, the mainstream narrative, buying Twitter, pissing people off. Correct. How do you feel about that as an entrepreneur? I personally, I, re I respect it that he's able to, that he wants to do that, that he's brave enough to, to be outspoken and, and say what's on his mind and do things that he thinks is helping the world. Uh, but it's scary. Uh, it's scary. It's very scary. He has more guts than anyone I've seen. I mean, he is absolutely fearless. And myself, I don't want to piss anybody off in government. I want to, I want to settle my cases and stay off the radar and don't piss anybody off. Because the government is the most powerful force on earth. Yeah. The U.S. government, they, they, they lose a trillion dollars a year. Their budget deficit is a trillion. It doesn't matter. I mean, they don't have to balance their budget. They'll just grind you it's into so the big. dirt. They'll hire prosecutor after prosecutor, file charge after charge, and they will grind you and grind you. I saw it, I saw it when I spent 21 months in prison. They grind these people to, they actually grind them to the ground and that's how they win. They don't necessarily have justice or truth or any of those things in mind. They just want to win and they will grind you until they win. And it's scary. And so, yeah, you don't want to fight the feds. You want to, you want to, um, you want to stay a <laughs> hundred and, I mean, we say 10,000% compliance, a hundred percent of the time. We follow a hundred percent of the rules, a hundred percent of the time. And you could still go to prison doing that. Right. I mean, I said on the on the FBI tapes in my case, just the last thing I said was, I want to just make sure very crystal clear, everything we are doing here is fully compliant with the law. And around the room, lawyer, chairman of the NCGOP, Mike Causey wearing a badge, insurance commissioner wearing a badge, everyone said, yes, there's nothing wrong with it. They still indicted me and I still went to prison. So be very, very careful. And I, I you know, all that is coming to a huge admiration for Elon Musk. That guy is tough. He's a warrior. He absolutely is. And that's why he's successful. He's like, he's going to turn Twitter around. He's, you know, he's been, a, his near death experience with Tesla now and then SpaceX is doing great. And I think he's going to do wonderful things with Neuralink. I think there's big opportunities there with the brain computer interface. I'm with you there. I could talk about Elon all day. Yeah. Uh, going back to kind of what happened with the indictment. Yes. Uh, we said we're always learning as entrepreneurs. Is there a lesson here for upcoming entrepreneurs or people who are running a big company that maybe haven't run into issues yes. yet? What Lots can those entrepreneurs learn, look out for? What should they be aware of that they might be naive to now? I think the most important thing in today's political world where political moves end in prosecution. Po the prosecution has become a political weapon in today's country. Uh, we see politicians using the power of the Department of Justice to go after their political enemies every day. It happens on a state level, happens on a federal level. And so you have to be religious and avoiding politics. If you want to be in business, yes. business is really simple. You serve customers, you deliver value to people, and they buy your products.
focus on that. And it's a gratifying game where you can build a company and you can build a customer base, you can build a brand, you can do all these things that are building. Politics is exactly the opposite. Politics is the ultimate lack of integrity. I mean, you you basically say something that people want to hear instead of saying something that's real about your product. So if, if, if politicians ran businesses, they would fail overnight because business is about integrity, about honesty, about your brand, about doing the right thing. I mean, I said, on the FBI tapes, we're going to do everything right here. We're going to follow every single piece of law out there. That's one of my quotes. And that's how you do business. In business, you follow all the rules. You are religious about rules. If anyone tries to violate a rule, you you push them out immediately. You can't have that in your company. Right. And so politics is exactly the opposite. They bend the rules. They make up the rules. They use, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Avoid politics. Avoid politics. Don't donate. Don't open no. your mouth politically. Exactly. Do not donate. I mean, Disney got a huge problem here in Florida. Yeah. They got, you know, they got involved in politics and now DeSantis is going after him with a knife. Yeah. It never ends up well, but companies keep well. falling into it. Do you think that's because they just get so big that they get dragged into it by politicians and by people on either side demanding they make a statement? Why? Jay, it's a great question. And the truth is, Businesses are extorted by the politician. I didn't want to give any donations. The mm. first campaign donation that I gave to the incumbent was because he asked me. And then he said, well, can you do a fundraiser? What do you say? He's my insurance commissioner. No, go F yourself. No, that ain't going to work. Yes, we'll do the fundraiser. Right. So business people don't want to spend money on politics. It's an expense. And so they get dragged into it. Politicians are hammering these guys for donations. Right. And this politician, he had 107 attempts to get me to do a donation to his campaign, all to try to set me up. 107 attempts. I kept saying, no, 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 I don't want to donate. And he says, well, I'm the insurance commissioner. You got to donate to me. He literally said that on the tape. So um, it's, it's sadly, it's extortion. It's a cost of doing business. And, you know, if you are, if you're Pfizer or you're Merck or you're, you know, Boeing or you're one of these guys, you, you have no choice. Yeah, you have shareholders too, which is... A different story. Yeah, shareholders, a whole other case. I mean, the biggest companies, all the Fortune 500 companies, pretty much, they have they have no choice but to be involved in politics, to defend their interests because the politicians are hitting them, um, et cetera. So say you could go back and the congressman, the commissioner comes to you and asks you for a donation over and over again. What would, is the right response? I would never take another meeting with a politician. Uh, and if the meeting absolutely has to happen, have your lawyer do it. Yeah. Send your lawyer, send a criminal defense counsel. Like, like a mob, keep them out of your life. Just Absolutely. <laughs> just do not do not go to fundraisers. Do not do fundraisers. Do not donate. If you have to deal with politicians, hire a really good law firm and say, I'm not doing any of these meetings. A lot of people get sucked into the glory of it. Oh, I can donate. And the, pol politics is about honor. It's not about truth. You know, Plato's hierarchy of the soul. At the top is the truth. Business operates on truth. Yes. The truth is your financial statement, your customers, your brand. That's truth. Politics operates on honor. It's, they don't, there's, the truth is not, not in the equation. And don't get sucked in it. It's not honorable. Especially today's 21st century politics. It's a blood sport where you can wind up in prison. It is. And I, I, I agree with your advice too. Uh, as much as I want to encourage other entrepreneurs to be like outspoken, like say, say what you want to say. We need more people, more voices out there. Uh, it's just dangerous for Very. your company. And Very. especially if you're running, uh, you know, a big, I have 50 something employees uh, and it's not thousands like you had, but still I'm responsible for this. And I could drag the whole company down Correct. by opening my mouth. And that is a Correct. terrifying thought. Exactly. Yeah. Now on a personal level, I, I run a PR firm. We do crisis yeah. management. I've been through a crisis myself. How, how did that something like that affect you at the top of your game? What was that experience like for you emotionally in your life? What, what was that like? It's a great question, Jay. Um, it started out, I was depressed. I, did, I was like a deer in the headlights. I didn't know what to do. Um, you know, we knew this was coming. The, the FBI shows up and they, you know, ask you all these questions. And, um, you know, I knew this was coming for months before the indictment. And I was like a deer in the headlights. I didn't know what to do. I um, my whole world view was changing and everything was changing. And then I was indicted. And then at the top of the indictment, it said United States versus Greg Lindberg. I'm like, game on, bring it. You know, you want to fight? Let's fight. So yeah. it put me into that. Oh, okay. I get this. It's Greg Lindberg versus United States. Now we have something to fight about. And so I got, immediately I got focused. 
I got onto the PR. I got onto the uh, PR, by the way, and you're in a great, a great industry. PR is everything. There's a great quote from Bill Gates. He says, he says, if I was down to my last dollar, I'd spend it on PR because PR will define you. And unless you define yourself, your enemies, your adversaries are going to define you. So business people don't get involved in politics, but do a lot of PR. Define yourself. Hire Jay. Define yourself before your adversaries can define you. No, thank it's you for critical. sharing. I agree. And I, it's, honestly, it's how I got into PR too. You're, you learn by force. Most people don't even think about it until right. it's too late. Right. And they need to because it's everything. It's everything. It's everything. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's very good. Uh, so one of the hallmarks, like what you teach, the core of it is motivation. It's self-discipline. Yes. And now it's longevity. Yes, Tell me a little bit, uh, obviously we could probably talk about motivation for hours because yes. it goes so deep. What are some of your tricks or lessons that you teach to stay motivated, to become a motivated human and to make that last several years all the way through success and then to keep pushing once you reach that hypothetical bar of success uh, to that next stage and the next stage until you've been able to build a, a billion dollar company. How do you do that? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. A couple of techniques. Motivation starts with daily habits. You build these daily habits into your routine. So let's just talk about exercise. Exercise is difficult for a lot of people. And exercise is brutal. I, I worked out my two hour workout today. And and I didn't want to do it. I didn't, I didn't I, God, it's, boy, I really don't want to do exercise today. So I envision I'm doing a 90 hour fast every week and I break my fast uh, tonight at 9.30. I'll have a nice dinner. And so you move the screen. There was a quote from this, uh, this Netflix series, Altered Carbon, where this, this guy, he was this envoy and he says, how do you make it through torture? They're torturing him and he's making it through. Uh, psychologically, you just move the screen forward. So no matter how bad your life is, no matter how hard the workout is or how painful your fast or your business problem or your stress or whatever, business issue or physical or personal issue you're dealing with, move the screen forward. Because there's a beautiful screen. Maybe it's when you're reading your, you know, reading a bedtime story to your son. Or maybe it's when you're taking a vacation. Or maybe it's simply when you're having a feast and you're going out to a, a nice dinner. There's always a forward screen in your head. And so live that. And, and, and really live it to the point where the current reality, however painful it is, doesn't, doesn't exist on the same level as that forward screen. Anyway. Reframing things like that is so useful. And there's a lot of different ways people can do it, but it's much easier said than done. Much you easier. know, reframe, move the scene forward, uh, and getting yourself to do something when you don't necessarily want to do it. You wake up at 6 a.m. and go to the gym for two hours. Uh, obviously, no one ever wants to do that. I don't want to do it. You don't want to do it, but doing it anyway. Right. It's easy to say. It's hard to do. Were you, were you always like that? Or was, it, was there training involved? to get you to adopt that new frame of mind? That's a great question, Jay. I, I was lucky I was born with a highly addictive personality. I have a lot of addicts in my family, my brother, my father, you know, alcohol has been a real problem. My grandfather died of alcohol poisoning. And so I have this addictive gene. So I know that, and I know that whatever I do, I'm gonna get addicted to. I used to eat Twizzlers, and I'm seeing four or five packs of Twizzlers every night. That's not good. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm trying to be a health nut, eating like sugar and corn syrup. So. I have trained myself to become addicted to things that are positive in my life. So right now, I, I love to work. I'm addicted to my, to my exercise and my business and my work. It's, I love it, and I can't go a day without it. I can't take a day off from exercise. Um, I feel funny. I don't sleep. It's, my hormones get whacked, and I can't take a day off from work. I work virtually every day. And so it's because I love it. And frankly, I'm addicted to it. Unless I get that, that rush of figuring out what I need to do and the next challenge and getting onto it. So, and then you build a habit and your habits turn into your character and your character is your fate. It's that simple. So thoughts in your head lead to actions. Actions lead to habit. Habit leads to character. Character leads to your fate. And so it's not a it's not a one-time thing. It's got to, you got to wake up every morning and do the exercise. For a long time in order for it to become a habit. Forever. Yeah. I mean, I've noticed that you can get a good habit going in about 30 days. 30 days. Yeah. What are some of your habits? I'm sure you've tried lots of things, ice baths, yeah. meditation. Uh, yeah. I certainly have. And some stuff sticks and some doesn't. What habits have been transformative for you? The biggest transformative habit I have that can help your viewers is fasting. I started fasting. I went to prison. I had an 87 month sentence and I wanted to get 87 months back. And so I did a 
read a thousand, literally a thousand medical journal articles. I did all this research. I got these mailed into me and I came up with a solution. Calorie restriction reverses aging. There's hundreds and hundreds of articles that show this. It not only reverses aging, it primes your stem cells, it lengthens your telomeres. It does everything to rejuvenate your body. And there's all kinds of drugs and supplements that will mimic calorie restriction, NAD and, you know, metformin and all this other stuff. But, of course, sitting in a prison cell, you're not going to get any of that. Right. But you do have one thing. You have willpower and you can starve yourself. So I started not eating two days and then three days and four days and then five days. And so for most of my time, the 21 months I was there, I, didn't, I did a weekly four or five day fast consecutively every week. And my eureka moment was that I found a hair growing out of my head that was gray on the tip and red at the base. Wow. I had mostly gray hair. I'm 53. This is all natural. No hair dye, no nothing. Um, you brought the color back into your hair with fasting. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. I asked one of my good friends who would come visit me every weekend. I said, Bo, what is the one thing that would be incontrovertible evidence that my fasting program reverses aging? He said, well, Greg, when your gray hair turns red again. I said, okay, watch this. Six months later, it started to turn red again. It's almost all red now. A little bit of gray on the side. Um, and then I started to do all these other biomarkers. And lately, the most profound thing I did is five years ago, in April of 2018, right before this massive legal battle, right before this huge amount of stress, uh, I did my telomeres. And my telomeres were 7.1 kilobits. And at 7.1 kilobits, that's an average for like a 60-year-old. They were critically short. I wasn't in terribly good shape. I had sleep apnea, I had pre-Parkinson's, I had all these problems. And I said, okay, that's nice. And I put that on the shelf. I did my telomeres this July, two months ago. They were 8.57 kilobits, which is the average for a 28-year-old, and it's in the 99th percentile for someone my age. So um, basically, my body rejuvenated itself. Absolutely incontrovertible. It's not just the color of your hair. This is your telomeres, which are the Hayflick limit. We all age based on Hayflick. Hayflick says we all are going to live to 120 because the telomeres only, only allow the cell to divide so many times. Cell division happens about 50 different times and then you're dead. That's Hayflick. That's his theory. It's wrong. Hayflick is wrong. Your telomeres can be lengthened through a simple program of eating on the weekends. My theory, and it's proven with my telomeres, is if you only eat on weekends, your body will not age. You will rejuvenate yourself. You will rebuild your brain and your body and... Your, your, your age is simply a lifestyle decision. It's funny. We're seeing all of these billionaires investing all this time, money, and energy into living forever. There's a lot of experimental treatments out there. Intermittent fasting is one of, yes. I think, probably the most proven yes. by science. Very well proven. Very well proven. Uh, I do the trick intermittent fasting, don't, one meal a day, only at dinner. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yes, I agree with you. I think it's very exciting. And I'm excited to see how many people we see live to 150 maybe even 200 They're years old with to. all of the new technology. They're going so you to. mentioned fasting. When did you first get interested in longevity? And then what is your, and then what have you done since? Who have you seen? What markers do you look at? What treatments are you constantly doing? Uh, you mentioned NAD. I take an injection every morning of NAD. I have been interested in longevity for a very long time. And I, back in 2020, um, I really got serious about NAD and nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, which is another form of NAD. And I got very interested in fasting. I started to do the, the one meal a day mm -hmm. in 2020. And I, w w I, had, a, I had a wake up call. I went to, a, I went to a, um, a physician that advertises a full body MRI and a full body uh, CT scan. I did that and I already had congestive uh, blockage in one of my heart arteries, which it, I thought it was in great shape, and that's a big problem mm -hmm. at my age. So, um, so I got on the fasting program, but I, I couldn't, I didn't have the discipline to really go and do it to actually restrict your calories for real. There's all these calorie restriction mimics, yeah. which are actually very valuable. And now, in the last few years, you have injectables. You have epitalin out there, which is lengthens telomeres and promotes mitochondrial biogenesis. You have all these peptides which are coming on the market as injectables. NAD is an injectable, which is a, exactly the right way to do it. it. Goes straight to your bloodstream. I mean, I was taking mega doses of uh, vitamins, NAD vitamins, and that just gets mostly processed out in your gut. So I think having seen some friends who are doing peptides um, and doing NAD, and I, you can just touch their skin, it feels like baby skin. Um, and I can see them getting younger, the, their face is flawless. I think it's possible 
and they do some intermittent fasting. Uh, There's one friend of mine, she does uh, one meal a day. Um, and if I think that program actually will stop aging. I've seen it myself with some of these people that are doing this program. You don't need to go the four or five days, you know, brutal, no food. And that's, that's dangerous for some people because you can lose too much weight. Yeah. My biggest challenge in doing the four or five day fast is constantly trying to keep my weight up. Yeah, um, hard to build muscle when you're only eating twice a week. Precisely, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, um, but for most people, I think the, the revolution in longevity is coming with the supplements and the injectables particularly. Uh, have you experimented with any of the more out there treatments? For example, like blood boys, uh, I think some of the billionaires are finding younger men yep, or young younger plasma? siblings yes. to do tr blood transfusions with them. Uh, yep. Yep. Good question, Jay. Um, that's been proven effective. Uh, there's a physician out there, Diane Ginsberg, who's proven in several different studies it reverses Parkinson's symptoms, and it's it's very effective. Yeah. I am an absolute hypochondriac. I uh, I I'm nervous about injecting anything in my body. I don't like needles, <laughs> and, um, and I don't do the injectable vitamins. But um, no, I have not experimented. But I was planning on it. I was researching it, and until I discovered simply the old-fashioned star for five days. Um, I was, that was absolutely, I was thinking of building a business around it. I mean, a hyper, we, we check this plasma three or four times for any infectious diseases, make sure you're not injecting HIV or something like that. And um, yeah, th there's a, there's a good business there. Um, and, uh, but I never went there. I, you know, in a way, fortunately, I had the I had the opportunity sitting in a prison cell to learn the hard way of how to starve myself. Yeah, who goes to prison and learns intermittent fasting? That's amazing. It was a good able to discover that there and thank you and make that work there. And you're kind of gone into that business, right? Lifelong Labs is a recent project of yours. Correct. Tell me a little bit about that. What are you doing with Lifelong Labs? We are simply trying to get the word out at this point. Um, we don't sell anything right now. I've got a new book coming out, uh, Lifelong, that'll be released here in the next month or two, and uh, the book will be downloadable for free on the website. So we're just trying to get the word out to help people. Um, I, I, my time in prison, one of the most important things I realized is there is a greatness in every single human being. These were, these were federally convicted people sitting in a federal prison and every single person I met had a greatness within them. One guy was a poet. He had memorized, he'd been, he had been down for 20 years and he memorized 1500 poems and he would do the most beautiful calligraphy wow. greeting cards with his poems and he would give me a couple and Ulysses S. Baker was his name, a wonderful human being. And so there is greatness in every single one of us. That's really, Lifelong Labs is about you, Jay, unlocking your greatness and your employees unlocking their greatness. And how do you unlock your greatness? You need energy, you need time. Greatness and mastery in any particular field takes 10 years, 20 years. And so, if you have time, you have longevity, you have an extra couple decades or an extra five decades, you can live to 100, you can live to 120, you can take on a new career and you can achieve the greatness that I think is within every one of us. How old do you think you're going to live until? I don't know. I, um, do you have a goal, a number in mind? I, I have committed, I have a, a checklist on my fast. I committed to doing 10,446 weekly fasts in a row, which when I started, that was over 200 years. So um, we'll get to the 10, 000, I'll get to my 10,446th weekly fast in the year 2,222. And so I hope I'll achieve that. I think I become, since I've realized that you can keep yourself this healthy and I've seen my telomeres getting longer and my hair getting red and my body getting in better shape, um, testosterone levels going up. Uh, Does it? Absolutely. Wow. I saw I'm another important biomarker for us men. You know, a lot of older men take testosterone supplements. I've seen my testosterone almost double. And uh, it's, that's very profound. I don't, you know, a lot of people get to midlife and they feel like, hey, you know, they, their vitality is slipping away. Yeah. And, um, and so right now I'm focused on continuing the routine and, and not taking physical risk. You know, when you realize you, you want to plan for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, be very careful what you do physically. Um, and, you know, try to, try to avoid dangerous things. Right. Any uh, unexpected so, death. My friend worries about me on my unicycle. I ride a 45 mile an hour electric unicycle to there work you go. every day. Well, usually with the dogs, but yeah. un unnecessary risk probably. I think yeah. will kill me for sure. Yeah. Well, you're wearing a helmet and of course. I'm sure you're safe. <laughs> but, uh, um, so Greg, say you live to 200. What goals do you have in business and life? What do you hope to accomplish? Anything cool you want to buy? Tell me That's about a great that. question. You know, since I've, I've really, um, 
I've really changed my my view on life since I've got into this fasting. It's kind of a, a very different position in life. My number one priority right now is intellectual curiosity. I've been studying a lot of quantum physics, a lot of thermodynamics, a lot of engineering and chemistry, and I, it's become a habit, and it's become one of those habits I can't shake. Before I go to bed every night, I have to study my quantum physics. It's just so fascinating. It's like I'm, it's like my telomeres are now average age 28. It's like my brain is in its 20s again, and it's, it's, it's hungry for knowledge and a new career. I mean, if I had to pick my life all over again, I want to be a scientist. I want to, I mean, the, 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 what, the inventions, the breakthroughs in technology and science in the next 50 years are going to stun everybody. I mean, we're going to, we're going to invent superconductors. I mean, you can imagine superconductors right now. This is old-fashioned electricity with electrons bumping into each other as they move through a copper wire. Superconductors are a state of quantum coherence that electron zips with no resistance right down the wire. It's going to change everything. We're going to invent new forms of energy. We're going to invent new forms of um, travel. We're going to, I mean, it's just, it's all, it's all, it's all coming. It's and I'm very excited about it. Motivations to extend my life as long as possible. I want to be here to see all of it. You're going to see it. That happens. You're going to see it. Aliens might be happening now. That was on my list. Exactly. <laughs> that, that, you know, that's one thing to worry about. I mean, you know. You think what, they're real? I don't know. I, I can't tell. There's some very credible people that get up in front of Congress and say they are. But right? I don't know. <laughs> this, this Mexican alien that they dissected. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's I'm, really crazy. I'm not sure what to make of it either. It all feels know. like a big distraction. But like you said, there's some really credible people out there right. getting, exactly. getting in front of it. It's a, you know. it's, a, it's a cool time to be alive. It is. I know one thing I learned about the truth in medicine, studying medicine and coming up with this longevity program was unless you got a hundred medical journal articles saying the same thing, you can't trust it. And so intermittent fasting and doing a one day fast, doing a two day fast, there's a whole series of articles that a two day fast, a 48 hour fast is equal to one chemotherapy treatment in terms of shrinking a tumor. Right. So um, you got to be very careful with the truth. I love studying journal articles, and there's a lot of research. What's the data tell you? And so the data on aliens, I don't know. I haven't seen it, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> hey, we will see. Exactly. Uh, so, Greg, kind of wrapping this thing up, yeah. what are, what's the one thing you want the audience to take away from in terms of business? If you could leave one nugget with them that's going to help them be successful in their business career, what would that be? You can do it. I believe in you, and you can do it. The one thing I sat in a room, uh, I taught I taught uh, prisoners at the federal prison camp. It was the most wonderful thing I did, and I these were guys that are gangbangers and drug guys and you know, gunshot wounds, knife wounds, all this stuff. And I said, you know, William, I believe in you. You can do this. You can do this. And, he, and the guy said tears in his eyes. No one ever told me that. Wow. No one. I mean, we you come from a great family, Jay. I'm assuming, given your success in life, your mother, your father had confidence in you. Yeah. They told you, Jay, you can do this. They had confidence in you. You know, a lot of people in the world, they don't come from, they don't have that lucky, they weren't the lucky sperm that got into a family that, that loved them unconditionally. I'm sure your parents love you unconditionally. Mine did. Great people. Um, and so you need that. You need to love, you need unconditional love to love yourself and to allow yourself to fail, to have confidence that you can do this because you can do it. I love that. Uh, and I was curious, you hear about Martha Stewart going to prison and she's in a prison with like a swimming pool and a tennis court. Yeah. You were a successful guy, went to prison. What was that like for you in terms of conditions? Were you able to go to a, a nicer place? We, we were lucky. Uh, I was lucky that I went to a minimum security prison camp, which was not a, a high level prison, not a low level prison, but a minimum level camp. And everyone there was nonviolent. That's the most important. A lot of, a lot of drug crimes, um, mostly drug people. It was about 50% African-American, 25% Hispanic, and about 25% white. A lot of, a good mix of people. And um, fortunately, it was nonviolent. Now, if I had made a mistake in that prison, and broke any one of the thousand and one rules, right. they would have kicked me up to a low security prison, which is above the minimum. And you absolutely have to take a knife to the bathroom in a low security prison. And the number the guys would come down from the lows. And once you uh, spend 10 years in a low, you come down to a minimum. And they would say, the number one thing they heard on the loudspeaker in the low was blood spill, unit three, blood spill, unit four. There's people getting cut all day long. Jesus. And they had to go clean up the blood. I never heard blood spill once. And there was a guy that got into a fight on the baseball field, they kicked him out immediately. So the, the Bureau of Prisons does a wonderful job removing the violent inmates from the minimum security plant. So everyone there could be your friend. 
they weren't violent. Good. That would and be that was a blessing. A huge the scariest blessing. moment of my life thinking, oh, my God, like I'm, I'm going to go to a prison. You hear about what happens in prisons. They, the best friends I will ever have in life came out of that prison. And now they're, look at you. You're helping them, helping prisoners. I am. They're Good wonderful people. Great people. Good for you. Thank All you. right. Back to, to business and growth. Yes. You seem very well educated across a multitude of disciplines. Thank you. You've probably read a lot of books. I'm curious what books have made a big impact on you. So if you were to leave the audience with a few book recommendations, what would those be? Well, thank you, Jay. You're very observant. I, I live in my son. My oldest uh, uh, son lives with me, calls it my man cave. And in my man cave, I got a little prison cot in the corner. And I've got these folding tables with my desk. And then I have 3,000 books on shelves. Wow. And books are my happy spot. Books are my first love. And the most important book, I think, for any of us to read is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. It's a classic how to train your mind and your character. The lessons from Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill are timeless. It's a 100-year-old book. Yeah, great book. I listened to that thing on tape for a thousand times. I just kept it going. This is a tape. I'm dating myself. Back in the 90s, you'd put a tape in your car and you'd just, it would, it would run. And... And uh, it's just, I mean, thank God for Napoleon Hill. He, he is more responsible for the formation of my character than just about any author out there. Yeah, that was a great book. I also Wonderful. read it several times. Uh, any, anything else, if you were to pick a couple more? I think, um, you know, some of the other health and wellness books are, are powerful. I mean, David Sinclair has a book out there on longevity. Um, it's, it's a very good book. I mean, I think... Uh, some of the books on the 80-20 principle, um, there's a book talking about 80% of your activity is a waste of time. There's 20% of what you do right. so that Pareto. truly delivers results. Yeah. Um, and so I think keeping yourself well-read is very important. Um, and even keep your old high school geometry book on the shelf and go back and learn Euclidean geometry and, and, and practice that. Not everybody has the the will to do what you do is l go learn other disciplines. It seems yeah. like you've gone and you've studied medicine, you've studied science, you've studied physics. Yes. Do you think that's translated into your career as an entrepreneur? Or did this come later? I think it's, I think it's a result of fasting. My brain, when you fast for four days, lots of studies show that brain drive neurotropic run on ketones. It's different. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And your, your brain grows. Your brain has a brain growth hormone. When you have a stroke and you go into the hospital, they're going to give you BDNF brain-derived neurotropic factor. And they want your brain to recover and grow from the stroke. But your BDNF naturally is 20X after four days of no food. And so you know what you need? If you're at four days of no food, you absolutely have to study something. Because another that, you're going to eat. <laughs> and so for me, it's uh, I love it because it keeps my brain away from the hunger. Love that. Well, Greg, thank you for coming in and sharing some of that day. big brain with us today. Thank you. I learned a lot. I know the audience did too. Uh, this is a blast. Thanks again. Thank you. It's been wonderful.